What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash stories about Kevin. Alright, this story's called, A Very Long Story About a Very Special Soldier. This story begins with our humble narrator, me, 18, male, at the time, a young man hailing from a small town in Washington State. This was in 2005, and I had decided to escape a very controlled controlling and toxic existence by joining the army. After enlisting, I found myself traveling halfway across the country to Missouri, where I not only received my training and changed my life for the better, but also met the subject of our story. I first met the subject in processing into basic training at the prestigious Fort Lost in the Woods, Missouri. Like most brand new soldiers, I was half dead through sleep deprivation and sat in a random seat right next to a female who bore a striking resemblance to a fat Harry Potter with the personality of Farva from Super Troopers. Good news for anybody with a fat Harry Potter fetish. I found this person mildly annoying but wasn't all that assertive back then so I put up with it. We were eventually shuttled off separately and I assumed I'd never see this person again. Now imagine my surprise when I see this person get get off a different bus at the same basic training company. Over the course of the next week, I made a startling conclusion. This person was quite possibly the most insufferable human being I had ever met. Throughout basic and MPAIT training, I slowly blossomed into a halfway okayish soldier while our counterpoint, who I'll refer to as the Kramer, it rhymes with her last name, constantly held our platoon back from being the best platoon possible. At one point, one of our more mellow drills straight up told her, If it wasn't for us wearing the same uniform, I'd be jumping over this desk and strangling the life out of you. To give you an example, she constantly argued with our drills and various instructors over the smallest things, such as using notes during a test. We had been told we were allowed to use notes during one particularly hard test but she refused because she thought it was cheating. Every other platoon received a perfect score on the test. We were the only ones who had a fail. Indeed, this woman was a being of intense, concentrated stupidity that managed to keep our entire platoon from achieving awesomeness. We weren't the worst platoon, but it was pretty obvious to the rest of us that she was the curve that brought us down. Anyway, the good parts of the story start now. I found myself in the great state of Texas at a certain military post that is certainly popular for all of the wrong reasons. Fort Hood. It's Fort Hood. <laughs> I had initially reunited with a good friend of mine, Party Boy, not the famous one I had graduated with. At work, he was an amazing soldier, but after hours, he was a true force to be reckoned with. I have many humorous stories about him, but right now, he's not the focus. You've probably already figured out by now that Kramer made it to Fort Hood as well. Wouldn't be much of a story if she didn't, right? Well, as me and Party Boy were conversing with some of our other graduates from our basic, we heard someone call our names. We slowly turned and saw the Kramer call out to us, except now she was somehow fatter than before. Myself and Party Boy tried our best to escape, but her incessant chattering was like a gelatinous black hole. She proceeded to talk our collective ears off about the nonsense she had claimed to see at Fort Hood. Such gems included playing sports every morning for physical training, claiming all our MOS did was play video games and drink all day, and never had to do a weigh in tape. Of course, everyone else knew better, but she wasn't having it. Luckily, we only had to put up with her for a few days before she was taken to her unit. Unluckily for us, we ended up in the same unit a week later. To shorten things up a bit, I'm going to condense the unconnected events into a short list we can all chuckle at. While another private from my platoon was 
getting smoked, she started to talk crap to him. The sergeant conducting the smoking session was not having anything to do with that and focused his attention on her to smoke her instead. She became argumentative until her sergeant came out and told her to stop being insubordinate. The previous sergeant then smoked her for five hours. Her platoon was out in the field for training and overheard her platoon sergeant making a vain attempt to get two other privates to get him a box of grid squares. A classic hazing trick since grid squares squares are a unit of measurement on a map. The two smart privates, who I also attended basic with, weren't falling for it, but played along, utilizing the extra time to call their significant others and have a cigarette. When both privates returned, they informed the platoon sergeant of the box not being found, only to be interrupted by Kramer calling from her mounted position. Hey, are you talking about those wheat crackers? I have a box right here. While holding up a box of Triscuits. The whole camp didn't stop laughing until later that night. Snuck into Party Boy's room and stole his beer, cigarettes, and grandfather's heirloom lighter. Then lied about it for a week until a shakedown occurred and a whole bunch of other stolen goods were found. She lost her room key at one point and instead of getting a new one, just started leaving her window unlocked. Well, a couple of our other soldiers decided to cover her window in OC spray or pepper spray. Apparently, after she opened her window, she wiped some sweat from her brow and proceeded to be burned. She was promoted to the rank of private second class and immediately assumed she had authority over anyone lower ranking than her, including me even though I was literally pinned two seconds after her. Her. She was quickly put in her place by an NCO after she tried butting into a counseling session. She showed up to a barracks party and proceeded to get hammered to the point where she passed out, blocking the fridge while sitting up. The guys at the party decided to drag her down to the picnic tables and left her. She was then found by a passing sergeant who notified her leadership. She tried to claim she was partying with a few others, but they denied she ever showed up. Now, now the kicker. During all of this, we had been training for deployment. The Kramer had decided that army life wasn't for her and had been looking for an escape when she thought she found it. Enter Jack Black. Jack Black had come to our unit without much notice. I eventually became really good friends with him, but it was a while before that happened. Jack Black initially had a room close to the Kramers, but was waiting on housing for his family. That did not stop the Kramer. The Kramer proceeded to have an affair with Jack Black. They'd meet in her room at lunch almost every day. It finally came to a head when Jack Black's wife, who I'll refer to as Mama Soros, came screaming into the office demanding to know where her husband was. The Kramer's roommate, tired of the beaver sausage Kramer put her through, led her platoon sergeant and Mama Soros directly to the room. They obviously found Jack Black and the Kramer in a compromising position and all hell broke loose. Jack Black was busted down to private second class and divorce proceedings began for him while Kramer had only gotten extra duty due to UCMJ guidelines against extramarital affairs. Yes, you can get in trouble for cheating. Jack Black was still sent to Iraq with us, but the Kramer was kept behind for various reasons. That would normally be the end of things. But no, dear reader, there's more. And that is the truth. There are plenty more stories in the uh, User360 Entertainment's stories. Universe of stories. There we go. Anyway, uh, Kramer, you sound kind of crazy. Um, Cray Cray. <laughs> That's kind of funny. The crazy part is, I would never assume that Jack Black would have an extra marital affair with Harry Potter. It just doesn't seem like him. But it also sounds very like him, so who knows. 
This story's called, Kevin Helps Himself to Power Tools. I'm henpecking for wanting them back. On my blah blah, we'll edit for formatting when I get my PC set up again. Excuses, excuses, you lazy, lazy person. Followers of my Kevin encounters will be painfully familiar with my dip duty housemate, Kavina, 24 female, but this story actually involves my other housemate, a 22 male. Let's call him Jim this time, and Jim's father, Kevin. Thankfully, we are in the process of moving out from the current house share and into our own places. But as they say, let's not count our chickens before they hatch. So Jim has spent the last couple of weekends up at his dad, Kevin's place, sorting things out ready to move in, albeit only for a few days before his own flat is available. Each time Jim has traveled up there, they've taken a few bags bags or boxes of his smaller stuff in the car with them. This leaves only the biggest stuff for last when they have a van. That's a whole other thing that might get its own post. I'll see if I can survive this one first. Last weekend, Jim and his dad were checking in our garage for anything of his that they could take away in the car. Jim doesn't own anything that's in the garage. Kevin doesn't own anything in the garage. Apparently, this didn't stop Kevin from picking up a power tool he'd noticed and like the look of. I wasn't there myself, so I cannot be sure how the conversation actually went. But the result was that Kevin decided it wasn't getting used here anyway, and so he might as well take it for himself. Kevin didn't think to ask who the tool belonged to, let alone ask their permission to rehome it. He just picked it up and stepped off with it. Who does that? He didn't see anything wrong with this at all, which suggests just to me it's standard practice for him. That worries me. How many things has he accidentally stolen from people over the years just because he liked them? That's what two-year-olds do. They see something they want and they take it. Two-year-olds haven't yet developed their sense of consequences or morality. What excuse does a grown-ass man have for this same thought process? Anyway, so the tool was taken on, I think, Sunday afternoon, while I was also away sorting my own life out. On Monday, Jim and I were having a chill discussion about who owns what so we can plan packing and removal to the correct places. Thinking room to room, we got to the garage and I started listing off the items I could remember off the top of my head. There's a pressure washer in there that's coming with me. A hose, a drill, I think there are a few tools in there actually that I still need to pack up. Oh yeah, uh, there is an angle grinder in there too. Whose is that? That was here when we moved in. Oh, right. Well, my dad's got it. Uh, what? My dad took it with him. Why? What? He spotted it and said he'd make use of it. Uh? What? Does he often go to other people's houses and just steal crap he can make use of? Well, if it's not ours anyway. If you didn't know who it belonged to, he definitely didn't. But still thought it'd be fine to just take it without bothering to find out? Maybe ask permission? No? It belongs to the house, to the landlord. If it was here when we moved in, it has to be here when we move out. You can't just steal crap. If that thing isn't here when we move out this weekend, then we lose our deposit and risk our glowing tenancy references we're relying on for our new places. So should I ask him to bring it back then? No, you need to tell him that it better be back here ASAP because I am not losing out on my deposit because of some dip crap accidental thief who doesn't even live here. Oh, okay, I, I've messaged him. I told him why he needs to bring it back because it belongs to the house. Fast forward to about Wednesday and there has still been no mention of this thing coming back to the house. Many texts, emails, and phone calls have happened back and forth between Jim and Kevin in that time, arranging things for the weekend. But no mention at all of this angle grinder. I asked Jim on Wednesday evening when his dad was planning to drop it off. Already knowing the answer. Not only did Jim not know when, but
but with no mention of it at all, he wasn't sure if he was planning to ever bring it back. Sensing the 20 ton hints I was dropping on his head, Jim called his dad and asked straight away about the angle grinder. I was packing up at the time, so I couldn't stick around for the conversation, but the result was at least a confirmation that Kevin would return it this week. Good! He shouldn't have taken it in the first place! Yeah, apparently it doesn't work. And that's the reason he's bringing it back? Because it doesn't work? You know what? At this point, it's clearly not worth it. I shouldn't have to explain to someone twice my age the concept of theft or property rental inventory. If he's returning it, he's returning it. It's clearly too much to ask for him to do so for the right reasons. <sighs> Then we get to tonight. It's Thursday evening and Jim's big stuff move is tomorrow. So he and Kevin have been calling back and forth all evening trying to make arrangements. The short version of this evening saga is that Kevin agreed to drive over tonight to return the angle grinder instead of waiting, and I quote, Cause it sounds like you're getting henpecked. Henpecked? Really? Is it so unreasonable of me to expect you to return an item you stole from here? before the impending deadline we have to be out by? He did drive over with it, and Jim met him at the roadside to take it. As per Brovid rules, I stayed locked away inside like a muzzled Rottweiler, quietly seething in my corner. Jim claims he had a serious talk with Kevin before he left, but I have my doubts. Even if it did happen, I doubt a message will have gone through. The long version of this evening saga is enough to warrant its own post, so I'll link that here when I write it, which won't be tonight as I'm already too worn out from living it. If I survive this weekend without killing myself or any of the Kevin uh, collection around me, I'll likely post here about the events. I just assume at this point that there are more Kevin moments to come before I can finally hang up my Kevin wrangling gear. I'm not gonna lie, that sounds like an incredibly frustrating thing to deal with, and yes, that that does irk me when someone does something but not for the right reasons. Like yeah, you're watering the plants, but not because you're trying to uh, keep them alive and not dead, but because you think plants like the smell of water, so you're just having them smell it. You get what I'm saying. This story's called, My Ex-Wife Thought World War II Was Just a Movie She Watched. My now ex-wife was a bit of a Kavina. On one of our first dates, we decided to watch a movie and have dinner at my place. We decided to watch American History X, so anyone who has seen the movie knows the scene where Edward Norton starts screaming at his mom's Jewish boyfriend. Well, we get to the scene, and my ex-wife pauses the movie, and I crap you not says, So these National Socialist German Workers Party guys and these Jewish people, they have an issue with each other? She thought World War II was just a movie she watched in the 8th grade. Edit to address a lot of comments all at once. One, she picked the movie, not me. Two, yes, I'm aware this should have been a red flag. I was 17, almost 18, with low confidence. She was super hot and great in the sack. Three, yes, I am new to Reddit and I don't always hit the right button. <laughs> There's nothing more relieving than seeing the ex in front of the wife in this situation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, how you get to adulthood without knowing that World War II was an actual thing is beyond me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.